People tend to start these presentations with a meaningful quote, something from a great philosopher or a classic piece of literature that really gets to the heart of a topic. And I'm no different. In the words of the great children's book author, Felice Jacker, there's a zoo in my poo. Indeed, there's a zoo in all our poos because our poo, also known as microbiota, is a product of our digestive system's microbiome, a vast and complex system of good and bad bacteria coexisting in a fragile balance. But if you ask the average person what's in their poo, they'll probably just say last night's dinner, which led our team to a very interesting challenge. How do we get people to realize what's in their poo and how can we convince them to donate it for the greater good? Why would we want to do this? Well, at Lifeblood, we have established a pilot program in Western Australia to provide Fiona Stanley Hospital and Fremantle Hospital with a reliable supply of fecal microbiota for transplant, also known as FMT, to treat patients suffering from life-threatening C. difficile infection. FMT involves collecting microbiota samples from healthy donors, testing, processing, and transplanting it into patients suffering from C. difficile infection. In the future, this therapy may also help people with other bowel conditions like Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, or even play a role treating mental illness. The potential is huge, which may explain why we are only one of many studies happening in this space at the moment. From bone marrow to breast milk, organs and tissue, and of course blood, here at Lifeblood, we have over 90 years experience in the field of biological donations. And we're using that experience to find new donors for our microbiota program. But while we understand what makes blood donors give, understanding the motivations of a microbiota donor presented a new challenge. While we all have bowel movements, how we feel about them and even how we have them can vary from person to person. We needed some concrete data from the Australian population's bathroom habits if we were going to create the best experience for our donors. To achieve this, we partnered with Professor Barbara Massa and Dr Mel Hyde from the University of Queensland. Together, we developed the Australian Community Attitudes Towards Stool Donation research paper, which led to some valuable insights. From a sample group of 325 eligible Australian residents aged 18 to 73 years, 80% of participants reported a daily bowel movement, with most happening in the morning, particularly between 7 and 11 a.m. Women were more likely to have a bowel movement in the morning than men and at an earlier time. Those aged 18 to 24 years were more likely to have a bowel movement in the evening than those aged 25 to 54 years. Unsurprisingly, it turns out that 46% of respondents expressed they were too uncomfortable or avoided using a public toilet for a bowel movement, some to all of the time. And perhaps if you think back to your public toilet experience, some of these findings might ring true. When we asked why people avoided public restrooms, there were three main reasons. Privacy or being noticed by others, unhygienic environment, and noises, smells, and mess. If the terminology around public restrooms made people uncomfortable, we asked if collection facilities would be more inviting. Most didn't have a strong opinion. On average, people were neither willing nor unwilling to donate at a collection facility. However, 14% were very willing. Those extremely willing to donate were older in age, males over 34, and were also more comfortable using a public toilet. As we were building the production schedule, we wanted to find more donors who could donate for five days a week for two consecutive weeks. Was this too big of an ask? Well, as it turned out, yes, it was. On average, people did not think it would be possible to donate at this frequency, citing a variety of reasons, including logistical issues, trouble performing, and a general discomfort around noises, smell, and mess. However, 11% of participants thought it extremely possible. After identifying what the obstacles to donating were, we needed to understand what information people needed to overcome them. Interestingly, understanding how the donation could help patients was seen as the least important motivating factor, receiving an importance rating of just 43%, while convenience was the most important with a rating of 60%, closely followed by confidentiality and proximity to the collection facility. 
However, when we looked at what would motivate someone to donate, we found 66% of respondents agreeing that saving patients or improving their quality of life was the most important reason to donate. So people didn't need to know how they were helping others. They just needed to know that they were helping. When you think about it, this is an incredibly heartwarming insight into the generosity of people. And it's something at Lifeblood that we've been delighted to rediscover each time we explore this. After gathering the data, we had identified a small subsection of the population who were very willing to donate. But it was clear there were a lot of barriers we would need to address if we wanted this study to be a success. Comfort, hygiene and privacy were all major concerns when it came to donating in a public toilet. We need to ensure that people understood they would be donating in a therapeutic goods administration licensed toilet, where the facilities were rigorously cleaned and the cubicles are soundproof. From travel time to frequency, convenience was a huge factor for donors. We needed to do everything we could to make this big commitment as easy as possible. Having donors join the study only to leave due to inconvenience would be a huge loss. We also learned a lot about people's attitudes. Unsurprisingly, nobody wanted to be referred to as a poo donor and stool donor didn't fare much better. It became apparent that something more clinical would be preferred over the alternatives such as microbiota donor. As Lifeblood is one of the most trusted and respected non-for-profit organisations in Australia, we wanted to understand any potential risks to Lifeblood's brand by entering into the area of faecal microbiota for transplant. To understand the risks, we undertook a market assessment to test donor and public perception and determine any brand risk that may arise. An online survey was designed to contact non-donors, blood donors and clinicians. The survey covered overall reception to the idea of microbiota donation, how they felt this would impact Lifeblood's brand and their likelihood to donate. Fortunately, there was a positive impact on the brand. Respondents saw it as Lifeblood branching out to help more people and offering new services. It was clear that donors thought it showed we were being innovative and contributing to the healthcare of more Australians. Recognising the potential value microbiota could have for our brand, we needed to create clear rules around how we would talk about our work in this area. One of the first tools we built was the Microbiome Style Guide. The Style Guide is used in conjunction with the Lifeblood Language Guide, which defines Lifeblood's personality and style of writing. This guide helps us stay on message and created a professional, compassionate and heartfelt image of our microbiome pilot. Once we had an understanding of how we wanted to present ourselves as a brand and how we were going to talk to our donors, we needed to decide the best way to recruit them. To begin, we mapped out each step an applicant had to make to become a successful donor. We broke them down into phases, pre-donation for donor recruitment, donation for the collection model and post-donation for retention, along with pain points, opportunities and establishing any minimum viable features required for each step. We took the donor journey to an external group for validation, as well as our internal staff donors who were part of the donor testing panel. These donor journey maps are constantly updated to reflect the new insights we gather. The maps inform the design of both recruitment and collection models. To streamline our recruitment process, we designed a communication platform that allows donors to receive automatic messaging. The platform also allows donors to self-defer by taking an eligibility quiz, as well as supporting the donors in making an appointment and appointment reminders. This low-code tech can be changed and tweaked quickly to ensure we receive optimum expressions of interest from the public and create a seamless user experience for our donors. Of course, a communication platform is nothing without the right message. Taking all the quantitative research, the qualitative donor insights and customer journey maps, we developed a communication strategy built around a primary message that donating poo is a natural yet remarkable habit that helps people in need and gives you a feeling of accomplishment. To support this message, we incorporated a number of motivators in our communications too. Egotistic altruism, doing something good for others that will make you feel good. Be part of something bigger. As a microbiota donor, you'll be part of innovative research. Reassurance, the entire process will be clean, safe, convenient and private. These messages were incorporated into all of our communications. To show how they work together, let's take a look at one of the videos produced to educate prospective donors. 
Donating poo is a generous thing to do. At Lifeblood, we truly appreciate the effort our microbiota donors make to help others. So we're making donating as convenient, easy, safe, clean and private as possible. Here's how it works. Step one, donor screening. They say it takes guts to change someone's life. Just like our other donors, microbiota donors need to be screened to make sure they're healthy and that their donation is safe for the person receiving it. The screening process starts with us sending you an SMS with a few questions. Once that's done, you'll get a call from a friendly and discreet staff member with some confirmation questions. And then they'll book you in for an appointment for the final stage of screening. At every stage of the process, any personal and confidential information we gather from you is covered by privacy laws and our privacy policies. The screening requirements for donors are extremely thorough for patient safety, which means a lot of people don't make it to donating, even if they're generally healthy. So, if you do, you're pretty special. One in a handful of unique, life-giving microbiota donors in Australia. Step 2. Donating. Donating takes place at a private, single-purpose area at Lifeblood's Perth Processing Centre. You're able to schedule in a time beforehand that aligns with your body's own schedule and ensures your privacy. The donation toilet is a private, well-ventilated, soundproof, cosy room that is thoroughly cleaned to pristine condition after every visit. It's not like a public toilet. This is as private and as hygienic as a toilet can get. After a quick interview to make sure you're okay to donate, you'll be given a donation kit and plenty of time to relax in a private sitting area to let nature take its course. Once you're finished, one of our coordinators will collect the donation kit and you'll be on your way, knowing you've done something good for the day. Step three, regular donations. Once you've taken that first step, the most important thing for you to do as a donor is to give regular donations as often as you can. The more times you donate, the more people you can help. As a microbiota donor, your donations could help change the lives of people suffering from debilitating recurrent Clostridioides difficile infection and contribute to the advancement of science in this field that could ultimately change the lives of hundreds of thousands more. Thanks to a communication campaign backed by well-researched insights, we received over 150 initial applicants to be part of the study. However, breaking the stigma around donating microbiota is only half the challenge. Finding willing recruits who also met our rigorous standards was an entirely different story. Eligible donors needed to be between the ages of 18 and 50, live in Perth, Australia, and have a healthy BMI. We also had to screen for a range of medications as well as past illnesses and infections. Suffice to say, we were only looking for applicants made of the right stuff. At present, around 9 to 10% of all applicants pass the pre-screening appointment for the donor questionnaire to then undergo further tests before being onboarded as an eligible donor. The international standard pass rate is approximately 10%, so we do seem to be on track. But to increase our pool of eligible applicants, we are onboarding donors who were temporarily deferred to help get them back into the donor panel. For example, if an applicant recently had a live vaccine, they may be eligible to rejoin the panel at a later date. We're proud that Lifeblood is the first organisation in Australia to be licensed by the Therapeutic Goods Administration to manufacture faecal microbiota for transplant. Research into the microbiome and the use of faecal microbiota for transplants shows huge potential which is why it's so important we ensure the sustainability of programs like ours and those happening all over the world. To achieve this, we have already begun to investigate ways we can improve the donor experience. One area that we're focusing on is convenience. By allowing people to donate at home instead of a collection centre, we should be able to reduce the applicant dropout rate. However, this needs to be balanced with the safety and reliability of the donation process. We're also looking at new ways to recognise this incredible contribution from donors. Regardless of how our donors donate, they're still making a huge commitment and we need to ensure that they have the best possible experience. While we're not incentivising donors, we can do our utmost to make sure they feel appreciated. Currently, we're sending a thank you SMS after their donation and another SMS when their donation has been transplanted to a recipient but hopefully in the future, we can trial new ways to appeal and thank even more donors.
And with that, I should thank you for going on this journey with me and letting us share all the incredible work the Lifeblood team and our partners are undertaking. What the future holds for microbiome research, I do not know, but I am excited to find out and I hope you can join me as we do. Thank you.